Dr. Sherban, and uh, my presentation is entitled Testops Chasing the White Whale. Now, Testops is quite a mysterious term, and much like the mythical white whale, some of us have heard the legends, but um, few of us, if any, have actually seen it in the wild. So I'm here today to try to answer what is Testops? Is it even real? And probably most importantly, why should I care? So um, I'm a software engineer in test at eBay. Uh, uh, you can find me on Twitter at, at Jonas says go. Actually, there's a few people from uh, the eBay office in Milan here, right? Hello, guys. I can't, meet to, I can't wait to actually meet them after the talk. But uh, today I'm going to be uh, your captain on this quest. So I think the first question we need to answer before looking at what test ops is, is why do I personally care? Why am I on this quest today? So for me, um, what got me interested in um, testing and operations and stuff like that is when I was working on a team and I started doing performance testing. Now, performance testing, I kind of just fell into it. Uh, it happened to be that I was on a team that needed uh, some performance tests to be done. I was the only tester on the team, so I had to do performance testing. Now, you can't have good performance testing without proper monitoring. Um, performance testing without good monitoring is like shooting arrows in the dark without even knowing if you're hitting your target or not. So um, from here was kind of a slippery slope. I started asking more and more questions. I started asking stuff like, um, what alerts do we have? What logs, what do the logs look like? I started spending more and more time with the operations engineers in my company. And I'd go to their room and I would feed them candy and I would ask them to show me cool stuff. So, um, so um, from here was kind of a slippery slope. I started asking more and more questions. I started asking stuff like, um, what alerts do we have? What logs, what the log more, more time with the operations and logs look like. I started spending more engineers in my company. And I'd go to their room and I would feed them candy and I would ask them to show me cool stuff. So, um, so um, from here was kind of a slippery slope. I started asking more and more questions. I started asking stuff like, um, what alerts do we have? What logs, what the log more, more time with the operations and logs look like. I started spending more engineers in my company. And I'd go to their room and I would feed them candy and I would ask them to show me cool stuff. So, um, so um, from here was kind of a slippery more questions. I started asking stuff like, um, what alert testing? What does that mean? Or uh, even worse, sometimes it was in the form of DevOps is going to automate away all the testing. And I'm like, surely, surely that's not the case. Because uh, what I wanted to know with this thing, if you have this new way of developing software that has all these new tools and is promising to be so much better, how does this change testing? You can't tell me that in this new way, um, testing is going to just stay the same. I was interested in what you could do within DevOps to push testing forward, to build new awesome things and to uh, basically try testing in new and, un and undiscovered ways. So um, at that point, I came across this term called test ops. And I go like, yeah, surely that's what I'm looking for, right? Because you know, DevOps, test ops. And I was like, uh, OK, test ops it is, but uh, what is it? So again, I go to the internet and I start Googling. And uh, I'm looking left, I'm looking right. I read all, all, I read all of these articles. They're kind of sending me mixed messages. Some people say that it's kind of like smart monitoring. Some people say that it's more like data science. But it, it, at the end, I'm left a little bit uh, more confused than when I started. So I guess we're still looking at the question, what is test ops? But then I figured, you know, like, I'm, I'm, I'm a clever girl. I'm an engineer. I can figure this out for myself, right, like we do in our jobs all the time. So. If DevOps is uh, when development and operations meet together to solve a problem, then perhaps test ops could just be testing meets operations, right? So I figured um, we could start that. And um, you, you might be thinking like testers and operations, that's kind of an unlikely combination. Surely those things, just like the mythical creatures on uh, the slide, th that doesn't really exist in real life, right? Uh, I'm here to say that uh, I, I think it does, and today on the quest and find out if test ops is potentially real. So um, what I did was I took a step back and looked at my own work experience so far to try to find some sightings of the mythical test ops whale. Maybe there is something that I have done in my work so far that could be classified as test ops. So um, to going forward, I think we're going to, um, one way to define test ops is testing meets to operations or whatever happens when testing and operations come together to solve a problem. But a more pragmatic way to define it is you can say the test ops is whatever happens when a developer, a tester, and an operations engineer walk into a room. So going forward with that, I'm going to answer the question of why testers? I mean, surely, I mean, obviously I'm interested in this, but not all, test not all testers are the same. 
why would you want to have your testers involved with operations? So I think there's quite a number of reasons, but I'm going to focus on three. Um, testers are good at spotting defects. Now, everybody can spot a defect, but for testers, spotting defects is basically their superpower. By the way, that little cap is my poor attempt at drawing a pirate. He's pointing out a bug to his friends over there. So um, testers are basically um, accustomed to looking at patterns and picking up discrepancies. So if you have a tester looking at a production graph, say, interesting things might happen. Uh, this is actually a story that happened to me. I was um, working on a team at some point, and I had access to monitoring. And I was uh, looking at a production graph uh, for one day for some database tables. And um, before even realizing it, I had that nagging feeling that something was wrong. I couldn't put my finger on what, but I could tell that something was a little bit different. Now, if you talk to testers, you're going to uh, find that they say they talk about this all the time when they have this feeling that something isn't right. So, of course, I followed my gut and I investigated a little, little, bit, a little bit longer. And what I found out was uh, that by comparing um, the response times for uh, one of the tables in the database with the same response times from a week previous, we had been experiencing a tenfold increase. And I'm like, well, that's quite a discrepancy. That's interesting. Why would performance degrade by a factor of 10? It's quite alarming. So at this point, it wasn't um, a degradation uh, that our monitoring could pick up. But um, it was definitely uh, raising some questions. So with the help of my developers and the database administrator, we found out that uh, the table wasn't properly indexed. And because of a promotional event during the weekend, um, some emails had been sent, and the table was basically getting to a size where it was impacting performance. Uh, because I had happened to stumble upon this one day, um, we were able to fix this issue before any real users were impacted by it, which was a really good uh, thing for us. Now, would our monitoring have picked up this thing? I think so, but by the time that your alerts fly in production, that's already an issue, it's a critical thing, and somebody has to be w woken up at night. We were able to uh, just fix it without um, uh, any, any fallback, and it was pretty awesome. So um, another reason why you might want to involve testers in operations is that testers are already familiar with automation. Operations is a lot about automating stuff, provisioning environments, automating things with Chef, Puppet, Docker, Kubernetes, stuff like that. All of these things are new technologies that testers might not be familiar with per se, but testers have quite a bit of experience with automation. Now, I know this isn't true of all testers, but you can't deny that it's especially in recent years. In, in recent years, testers have become more and more familiar with uh, different automating tools. And I know a lot of testers who, even if they may not write code day to day, they use automation to write scripts to aid in their testing, to uh, help generate test data, to basically, um, um, you, it's basically they use automation day to day in their jobs. And um, another reason would be that testers are not afraid of new things. This is a tester poking an unidentified object with a stick. And this is exactly what testers do with software. They like exploring new software. They like playing with it. They like poking it. They like to try to expose failures in it. And they're very, very good at this. So these people, I think, are exactly the kind of people you want to have involved because they're good at spotting defects. They're familiar with automation. They're not afraid of new things. And to this last point, I know people who, uh, before becoming a tester, have been everything from a physicist to a flight attendant. So needless to say, these are people who are not afraid to uh, roll up their sleeves and try out a new technology or a scary new field. So I think uh, you should involve your testers in uh, your um, DevOps. Now, because I promised you I would tell you some stories from my personal work experience, we're going to talk about three of them. And uh, we're going to be looking at each of them in part, find out what happened, and then at uh, the end take a step back and think, could this possibly be test ops? Could it not? Why? And uh, we'll see where we get from here. So my first story is called Moving to the Cloud. Now, imagine you're part of a team. It's a cross-functional team, testers and developers, product owner, everybody works to deliver awesome value to their users. And you have like high velocity, everything is great, everything is going fine, until one day somebody basically tells you, oh, by the way, we're closing the data center at the end of the year, so uh, you have to move to the cloud. <laughs> so of course, um, you're, you're conscientious engineers, but at this point in your life, all that you know about um, AWS, it's that it's the cloud and it's Amazon's solution, and that's about it. So the first thing that you have to do when given this task with a deadline stuck on it is to understand what is your new environment going to look like. Because if you have like bare metal boxes in the data center, you already know uh, how many cores you have, what the CPU is, how much memory, 
uh, how the networking works. But the cloud, is all, it's all virtualized. It's a different beast altogether. So um, we basically took to going to the internet and investigating this thing. And what we found on Amazon's site was basically alphabet soup. So you've got your D2s, your T2s, your M1s, your M3s, your C1s, your newer generation C3s, now C4s. All of these things with different specs, and you wouldn't know how to choose. But even if you manage to choose your instance type, you still have to answer the question, how big do you want it? Is it large, extra large, maybe 2XL, 4XL, 8XL? This is obviously a little bit harder than uh, selecting your pizza toppings. So at this point, what do you do? So um, you have to answer the question, how do you choose? Now, one of the developers on my team at this point was like, well, finger in the air. I, I say we just uh, pick the second largest one from the left and go with that one. And I'm like, of course, I'm a tester. And I was like, no, no, we're not going to do that. We're going to actually test it. So um, what did we do? The first, uh, the first step was to study production. You take a look at your production graphs, and you see how traffic looks like over there. Uh, and you try to understand the performance of your existing system, because the thing that you don't want to do is to take any impact in performance once you actually migrate to the cloud. If anything, what you're going for is uh, at least the same performance, if not, if not an increase. So you have to study what you, uh, the, uh, your current system. And monitoring here is absolutely key. After, after looking at that, we uh, work to devise, uh, to devise a test scenario. This is basically saying um, uh, we're going to emulate what users are doing in production. And the scenario would look uh, something like, uh, in simple terms, like 70% of users would execute this flow, and maybe 19% would execute the second flow, and maybe there was another percentage of users who would do a third or a fourth flow, all in an um, attempt to um, emulate production traffic as closely as possible. So the next step is to actually run your test and gather the data. Um, we ran our testing against the staging environment. It was a perfect clone of production and had exactly the same instances set up in exactly the same way. And then what we did was to spawn up a whole new cluster in AWS. And this is where we could play around. We could play around with the instance type. Say you would start with an M1, uh, an M1 large, and you'd find out that M1 is memory optimized, but your bottleneck is actually the CPU. So then you might switch to a C1 large. And you see, oh, this is, this is much better, but maybe what does the C3 look like? And you'd compare different, in, different instance types, and then you could maybe uh, upgrade them, try Excel or 2XL to see the benefits. We'd also st uh, play with like the size of our cluster. What would happen if I would add a sixth machine instead of just five? Would that give me a proportional increase in performance? What, uh, we would basically do all these things that are generally done for performance tuning, but in the cloud, which was uh, very interesting. Now, of course, uh, we do all of these runs and we collect our data, so the next step would be to actually analyze it. You sit down with all of the data that you've collected, and you try to figure out you know, like, uh, what the impact of different changes are, which configuration works best for you, and then, and only then, you can finally choose your instance type. And the best part about this is that when you've actually chosen your instance type, you've done more than just you know, stick a finger up the air and say, I'm going to with the largest one and pray. You have actual data that you can show to anyone, not only management, but anyone who is interested. You can show them that we are going with this instance type and we are going to have these many machines and this is going to give us a, um, a predicted increase in performance of this percentage. And that was pretty cool. No, none of the other teams around us were doing that. So we were quite proud to um, uh, have this data to show them. So um, now, now, this is all nice and good. So you choose your instance types. But what we're actually here to find out is, could this be test ops? So um, before, uh, before um, we m move on to answer this question, I'm going to um, introduce a term. Who here knows what an oracle is? And I'm not talking about databases. I'm talking about what is an oracle when, in regards uh, to testing. Hands up. All right, there's a few people, there's a few people. Well, for the people who do not know, this slide is going to come in handy. So an oracle is a heuristic principle or mechanism by which we recognize a problem. Now that is a mouthful. Let me, let me break this down for you. So what this means is um, an oracle is um, what tells you if your test has passed or failed. Let me give you an example. If you have a specification that says, if a user does this action, the system should behave in a certain way, then when you're executing your test, what you need to assert at the end is that what happens is exactly what, uh, what the this, this specification provides. So in this case, your oracle is your specification. Uh, it could be that you have a system that generates predicted data for uh, certain tests, and you use that as your oracle. Or it could be that you're using a model as your oracle. Or in some unhappy cases, say, um, if you are rebuilding a legacy application, 
we're all on a new tech stack where all of the old developers have left the building and there's no documentation. Well, in that case, the old application is your oracle for different behaviors because that's all you've got at that point, right? So um, knowing this, let's answer the question. Could our first story be a, a sighting of test ops? For one thing, we're emulating production traffic. And to do that, we're looking heavily at our monitoring, our existing monitoring and production, which is definitely in the realms of operation. Then you're doing stuff provisioning new instances uh, in AWS, and you're working with developers to write code to do this thing. So there's, a, uh, there's an element of development, and there's definitely an, um, an element of operations. Then you're doing performance tuning, which is exactly displaying with the instance sizes, the types, the uh, size of your cluster. Uh, all of this stuff is generally done in testing. And uh, what I find really interesting about this thing is that you are using production monitoring data as an oracle. The way that you know if your test has passed or failed is by looking at the performance that you're measuring off of the new AWS instances and comparing it to existing production monitoring data. And only when you have like, um, the same or better performance do you know that your test has finally passed. So I'm inclined to say that this might be a sighting of the test ops whale. But let's carry on. Um, the next uh, story is in the, the same saga. It's called the Great Environment Migration. So, now, you've chosen your instance types, you're very, very happy, but the day is fastly approaching when you actually have to migrate your system to the cloud. So, this, you see, this is a system that's used uh, by millions and millions of users. There's millions of requests per second, and it's a key uh, service to the business. It's the login. If, uh, if users cannot log in or create accounts, they cannot buy uh, products, the company does not make money. So, you know, no pressure. That's all going to be fine. So how do, you, how do you ensure that this is actually going to go well? Well, to start off, since the data, um, the, the data center is actually closing, you have all of these environments uh, lying around. Like, lots of people have many test environments. You have your dev, your QA, your staging, maybe additional environments. And all of these have to also be migrated to the cloud. Because no data center, no machines, they have to go. So. Um, What's a good way to uh, migrate your dev environment, for instance, right? One thing that you could do is, uh, because this was uh, an internal service consumed by internal clients, you could just uh, send out an email and say, hey, guys, uh, dev environment is in maintenance for a couple of hours. We'll email you when it comes back. You tear down your environment. You spawn up the new one. You point your DNS to the new instance. You send out the email, and you're done, right? And this is a perfectly legitimate way to migrate a development environment. But uh, what we chose to do is something different. We saw each and every one of these test environments as an opportunity to rehearse our real production migration. So um, basically, the next story is what happened when a developer, an operations engineer, and a tester walked into a room to test out uh, the migration of the QA environment. So in order to understand um, how this thing went down, you need to understand a little bit about um, the architecture that was in play. In the data center, what we had this is pretty standard for web service. You had a load balancer in front of uh, some uh, instance servers. Uh, and the application servers were all talking to uh, some MySQL servers. So pretty standard. The first thing we did was to recreate the same thing in AWS. You have your elastic load balancer, which is AWS's solution for load balancing. Then you have your instance types. I think we went with C3s in the end at that point in time. And they're all pointing to RDS, which is basically a fancy Amazon MySQL server. So. Um, the first thing we did was to uh, set up replication between our data center um, and uh, the RDS, so um, that all of the data that was getting written to the database would be eventually replicated into the Amazon environment. And then we could get started. So first, it walks the tester. What the tester does is start a load test against uh, the existing environment. And basically, everything is going through. You're looking at uh, your graphs. Everything is fine. Performance seems good. You're free to carry on. Next, it walks the developer. Now, what the developer is, uh, does is to tunnel all the traffic from each instance uh, server into the new environment. Once you're tunneling traffic from one instance into uh, the cloud, then you can basically ramp down the application server because traffic isn't going there anyway. And we repeat it out for each of these. So at this point in time, all of the traffic from the load test that is going into the data center is actually being rerouted to the cloud. And because we have like, um, the replication setup, all the data is eventually consistent. Why we want to do this is because some, um, some um, clients will cache DNS. And when we would do the flip, we wouldn't want them to actually be pinging a server that wasn't no longer there. 
So at this point, all that's left is for the operations engineer to walk into the room and to do the DNS flip. So he did the DNS flip. Now your whole environment is pointing to AWS, and we were very happy. We pulled up um, the system. We saw the UI. We logged in, created an account. Everything seemed fine. We were basically patting each other on the back and almost high-fiving. We were saying, like, yeah, good job, team. And then we took another look at the graph, and uh-oh. Uh, the graph, uh, you know, everything was turning red. Alerts were flying. The system appeared to be down. We were like, well, that's not possible, because we just saw it a minute ago. It's up, right? We pull up the UI again. We interact with it. system is up. We get on all of the graphs. The system is down. So well, what happened here? Uh, because of how the um, an, an internal um, networking was set up, the DNS switch was actually a two-fold process. Uh, the first part was um, you would have to reroute the DNS for the um, internal corporate network, and there was a separate switch that had to be done for the external network. Now, for the development environment, now it's all nice and dandy because all your clients are internal, nobody would be affected. But if this were actual, uh, the actual production migration, all of our users, our actual real-world users that were outside of the corporate network, they would all see the services down. So not very good. What we decided to do from this mistake is to automate the DNS switch so that this mistake could never happen again. And there's quite a few things that we found out in um, other trial migrations as well. So I think this was a good decision. But again, what we're here to do is to uh, find out if this could possibly be test ops. Now, this certainly fits one of our definitions because you have a developer, a tester, and an operations engineer that are actually in the same room together at the same time. And what you're doing is you're leveraging previous performance tests, uh, but you're not using them as performance tests because you've already assessed the predicted performance of your system when you were doing the research for um, picking the instance type. What you're doing is leveraging these performance tests just to generate traffic. So um, another thing that's really interesting is that you are using your monitoring as your oracle. How did we know that our test had failed? Because the alerts went flying, which is very, very interesting to me. So all of these things are basically indicative that this might be another sighting of test stops. But um, let's move forward. The first story in the series is sometimes you can't scale horizontally. So. Um, what do you do when you have a denial of service attack in production? Let me, give you, let me give you some background here. So the same service that I'm talking about was dependent on another internal service. And they had had a pretty vicious denial of service attack that had caused the system to go down for several hours. It wasn't very pretty. And um, we knew that this needed handling because when they went down, we went down. We couldn't push the data into their system, so it was basically like us being down as well. So um, because this team was also going to move to the cloud data center closing, everybody in the cloud, uh, what uh, was uh, kind of going around is uh, that maybe, maybe, maybe we could outgrow our problem. Some of the developers were hopeful that if you just increase the um, um, machine sizes enough, if you throw, throw more memory, more CPU at them, if you made the cluster bigger, maybe you can uh, outrun this problem. Maybe the denial of service um, issue wouldn't happen anymore. So, of course, by now you figure out I'm a tester, so I said, great, let's test this. So, um, they said, you know, throw more metal at it, but you know how that worked for the Titanic, the biggest ship in the world, the ship that couldn't sink. So, I was very, very eager to test this hypothesis. So, um, what happened at this point, the first uh, thing, we had to recreate the conditions. There was a lot of talking between uh, me and my development team, the development team of this other service, the operations engineers, trying to drill through the logs, figure out what the exact attack was like. Uh, what caused it to understand the causes, and we tried to reproduce this. First, uh, we were doing this against the QA environment. Once we got the failure, we tested it against stage, and then what we did is um, once we knew that we could uh, consistently reproduce the issue, we um, uh, spawned up a cluster in Amazon and made it bigger, and we threw everything at it. More instances, bigger instance types, all the memory and CPU that money could buy, just to kind of see if this would help us. And uh, the next step, of course, was to actually rerun the scenario. So uh, what do you guys think happened? I hear some giggles, right? It bought us five more minutes, right? All of this uh, energy, all of these resources, they bought us five more minutes, which uh, meant that the um, problem was systemic, and you could not scale horizontally to outgrow the situation. There was some actual work that needed done on the application and the database and the way that these things interacted in order to uh, remove the bottleneck. 
But uh, it was definitely a very interesting learning experience. And let's answer the question if this could possibly be passed off. Again, you have developers, operations engineers, and testers working together. And this time, it's actually across teams, which is really exciting. And um, you're reproducing production conditions, which again takes a lot of investigation from all of these parties and takes a lot of uh, development to actually understand what was going on. You're provisioning environments from scratch, which is definitely the domain of operations. And once again, you're using your monitoring as your oracle. And when I say this, we're not only looking for, you know, like, oh, it goes red, then it's down. Uh, when we were trying to reproduce the um, scenario, we would look at the curve of the attack. So when doing the test scenario, we would compare the curve of the response times with the curve of the attack, configuring, is this the same thing? Are we off by a little bit? Do we need more traffic, less traffic? We're trying to recreate this until we actually could match the curve. We'd basically go exponentially and then crash because everything would go down. So we, having proper monitoring and doing proper investigating from the testing and the operation side allows us to actually reproduce this consistently and to, prove, um, to disprove the hypothesis that you could uh, outgrow um, your problem. So um, this is all, I mean, these are very lovely stories, but what I really want to know is what's next. Because um, even though these are instances when um, operations, development, and testing came together to solve issues, what they all have in common is that they're kind of one-off deals. I mean, really, how often are you going to migrate your production environment to the cloud? Hopefully only once if you're successful, right? So um, what, what, what I'm very interested in finding out next is what, what could be possible? What problems could you solve? What awesome stuff could you build if you had teams working like this all the time? If this was possible in a crunch to achieve these tasks because there was a deadline, data center shutting down was kind of looming, what could happen if everybody worked like this all the time and you would attack hard problems? Uh, how about uh, having your very own CI? Imagine, then w whenever you'd commit code, instead of waiting for the build to go out and potentially bad things to happen, you'd have your very own instance, say um, a VM with a Docker container running Jenkins in it, that would take your build, build it, you could see all of the tests, and all of this before you even push the master. And every developer would have this on their machine. You know that uh, thing that happens sometimes when one of your coworkers pushes something and leaves work at 5 p.m. and then is late the next day and they broke the build and you, you're impeded because you can't pull the new code? This would be a thing of the past. This would never happen if you had your very own CI. Now, how about um, generating tests from your production data? Now, in the scenarios that I described, we did a lot of analysis. We looked at the traffic patterns, we, but we tried to guess and to tweak our scenarios into resembling production. We don't really know if that's what real users were doing because it wasn't identical. It was just our attempt to reproduce it. But what, what if? What if you could, say, take your logs, process them, and generate tests from that data? You could, uh, at that point, not um, replicate production traffic or production-like traffic, but actually regenerate the exact same traffic that's going in production, in production against your test environment for your tests. Wouldn't that be awesome? then you would know that you're exactly replicating production conditions. How about tests that are actually monitoring? So many of us test in production, but uh, what I'm hinting at here is, what if you had tests that when they failed, they would be hooked up into the same alert system that you have for regular monitoring? That would mean that um, if somebody couldn't log in on your site, you could get an SMS or a call the same way that would happen if your instances were 99% CPU. Wouldn't that be awesome? Then you could actually monitor your application instead of just what's going on on the boxes. So uh, all of these things, by the way, these are not new concepts. There are people out there doing each and every one of them. But they're rare. These things aren't common. And I think that is because teams don't work together in this way. Because say, say you're a developer, and you would love your very own CI. That would be amazing. But um, you don't really know how, what your uh, build environment looks like. You don't maintain your CI. But uh, I bet your tester does, and I bet they know. And uh, say that uh, you don't know anything about Docker. How would you wrap that up? Well, I bet your operations engineer can't shut up about it. So if you brought teams together working in this way, you could potentially achieve all of these things. Now, um, of course, I understand. Uh, it's a long way away, and there's a lot of uh, impediments. Like, for instance, you don't have the same management. You don't have the same backlog sometimes. Sometimes these people aren't even located next to you. So my operations engineers, the ones in the story, they used to be segregated from everybody in their own little room. And uh, they would only come out when there was an issue in production. 
So when they came out, they would basically strike fear in the heart of testers and developers alike because they thought, oh, what's wrong with production? That would be the only reason why they would go outside. But working on uh, the way that we did, we managed to build a relationship. But you can do this too. And I suggest that you ask three little questions to do this. So the three little questions that you should be asking, I think. First one is, what are you working on? It's a very simple thing. Say uh, one person from your office is the Docker guy. And you'd like to find out more about this technology, but you just don't know what to do. It's very easy to just walk up to somebody and ask them, hey, uh, what are you working on? If you've got a few minutes, maybe you could show me that cool thing that you're doing. And uh, that's really important because on the one thing, you might learn something new. You might get the opportunity to spark an interesting conversation, maybe offer them some new ideas. And at the very least, you're building this relationship and you're showing one of your coworkers that you actually care. Most people that are into something kind of edgy and new, they don't think that people around them care. And if that's not true, then maybe we should show this. Um, an another question that you can ask is, uh, would, uh, when you do you want to see something cool? Now, this one you should use when you are the person working with the new exciting thing and you want to drive interest. So uh, what, the, uh, what happened to me was in my previous job, I was the performance testing girl. And everybody was like, oh, yeah, you need something with uh, performance testing. Just go to you and I shall take care of it. I'm like, that's not OK, guys. What if I'm sick one day? And I did happen to be sick one, on one of these days. Who's going to do it then? So I would constantly do this. I would stop people and say, hey, you have five minutes. You want to see something cool? Now, of course, like no person can resist this, but you have to deliver. But um, even if you're just showing them like some performance testing results that are these are potentially just boring graphs, but if you can uh, provide some interesting insight into um, the data that, that teaches them something about the system that they didn't know, this is going to spark people's interest, and they're going to come up to you and say, "Hey, that cool thing that you were doing, can I can I maybe peer with you next time? Can you show me how you do it? Can we do it together? Can you tell me more things about it?" And the real breakthrough came when the operations engineers that I just mentioned, the ones that never got out of their room for no reason other than alerts and disaster, they one day walked up to me, and of course I was scared, and they were like, hey, how's your testing going? And I was like, oh my god, the operations engineers are asking me about my testing. I am changing something. And um, you, you can too. It's, it's just a matter of asking these questions. And um, the third one is, can you pair with me on this? Now, Maybe at your work you don't do pairing. And you know, there, there are many reasons, many wonderful reasons to do pairing. But why I'm suggesting you do this um, is because you can drive people's interest in, uh, into something. Um, if you pair with them on the technology that you want to get them excited about, then you can basically see them learn from you. You can um, basically coach them. You can tell them what makes you excited about it. And say you have this awesome developer, or this awesome tester at work, and you think that they would really have a talent for working with this one thing like maybe Chef or Docker or something else, whatever technology you want to get people excited about. But you don't know how, and you can't expect them to say, I want to learn this new thing that I don't know anything about. So it's very easy to just uh, walk up to somebody and say, hey, uh, I need your help. If you have some time, could you pair with me on this task? And at the end of that, you have another person who spent just as much time as you have on that project, who knows just as much as you do about it, and hopefully, who's just as passionate about it as you are. And this is where change happens. So basically, asking these three little questions, what are you working on? Do you want to see something cool? And can you, can you pair with me on this? This, this makes teams like, stick closer together. Even if you don't have the same management, even if you don't live in the same open space, you could actually feel like you're part of the same team. And you have that comfort to be able to go to somebody and troubleshoot a problem, or maybe throw around some new ideas. And this is how you can get that uh, environment going where you can build some of these new exciting things. And this is where task ops really happens. This is how teams go together. And if you'll be doing them, you'll probably be ending up like those little happy engineers in the circle over there. So um, I guess my message for you is uh, the test ops is real. But it's not some white whale that you have to chase down. And it's not just something that other people do. Your team could uh, definitely do this too. And I think it's just um, a manner in which teams work together. So um, um, I encourage you to try these things out. I had one developer one time tell me, I don't like testing because testing is boring. And that might be true if what you think of testing is just running through a checklist and executing pre-written test cases that somebody else handed down. But testing is so much more. And I've, I've shown you some of the uh, ideas of what is possible when teams work together on problems with testers that involve testing. And I think 
we're just scratching the surface. I think there's a lot of hard problems to tackle that teams can if they're enabled to work in this new way together. And there's so much more that can be done, and we're just, just beginning to find these things out. So um, that was basically my talk. But before I leave, I'd like to help, uh, we'd like to thank some people. So um, first off, I'd like to thank the Speakeasy program. The Speakeasy program is a program, uh, it's, it's basically a brainchild of Fiona Charles and Anne-Marie Charette, who are two awesome testers. And they made this program to encourage diversity in, uh, in speaking. So it uh, basically coaches new um, speakers, first time speakers, and pairs them off with mentors. I got paired off with the wonderful Carson Feilberg, who helped me a lot because I'm a very nervous speaker. I'm terribly afraid of public speaking. And he helped me a lot uh, to come up uh, with a proposal, refine it, and get the courage to actually submit something. So I wouldn't be here today without these people. And I'd like to sort of send a shout out to uh, uh, the EPD team and eBay. They're an amazingly supportive team, and without them, I wouldn't be here today. And I also want to shout out to my previous team in the Adobe DIMS team, currently the identity team. Uh, these guys are legends. All of the um, Amazon migration stories are from my time with them. And if you ever get to meet them, you know, please buy them a beer and tell them that they're awesome. And last but not least, I want to uh, thank my friend Andrzej Grzegic, who uh, was an immense help. He's the only person who would give me critical, uh, constructive feedback on my presentations and my um, abstract because everybody else was just like, oh, that's so nice. But he was like, no, this doesn't make any sense. You should do this, you should do that. And it's really nice to have that com uh, comfort with uh, a, a fellow coworker and a friend who can give you that feedback. And uh, one of the things that Andrzej has taught me uh, is to uh, put in a picture of myself so that people know what I look like in my slides, very important, and also to use lots of pictures of cats. So, you know, like I've not been slacking, I've been listening. So uh, here, here is a picture of me holding this adorable kitten. And um, I'm, there's just a few minutes left, I guess, but I would be happy to take any questions that you have. Any questions? I guess uh, I'm, I'm, I've been pretty lucky. I've worked for teams that are very accepting, but there's not a lot of can uh, not a big pool of candidates. So even if you are trying to hire and find more diverse candidates, because of the way the education system is set up, where girls are told that math and science are not good, where minorities are maybe kept away or not put in the best prog programs, what you get is that when you're actually at hiring level, there's not a very wide pool of candidates. So that's like one of the biggest challenges. Uh, so the problem um, was basically that uh, we were making some very uh, ineffective database calls, it turned out. And those calls would just basically go slower and slower until the system would fall over. It would um, fill up all the thread pool. There would be no more threads, and then it would go down. All right. Uh, there's no more questions. Uh, thank you so much for coming to see my talk. Uh, and you can find me afterwards if you have anything. Thank you. Thank you.